Testing. Good morning. Good morning and welcome to the Sunday morning worship gathering here at Olivet Baptist Church. We are glad that you're here with us this morning. If you're a visitor, I want to encourage you to grab one of the Connect cards. You'll find those located in the back of the pew that's in front of you. And if you would just fill that out for us with your information, and then you can drop it off in this little box right here near the exit. You can drop it off on your way out. Uh, our elders uh, would love to just get in touch with you. There's a couple of things going on in the life of our church. Next week, we will be gathering for our regular Sunday service. We will have a Christmas worship gathering here, same time, 10 a.m. And in the following week on January 4th, Wednesday night activities that will continue. So no Wednesday night activities this upcoming week, but the following week uh, on January 4th, everything will be back to normal. And January 2nd, we will have a night of prayer and praise here at the church at 6.30 p.m. Uh, we would love for you to join us. And then lastly, um, we will be having a new member class on January 27th from 6 to 8 p.m. Uh, we provide a meal and then also childcare for anybody who is interested just to, to know what goes on in our church and what our church is about and would like to take the next step of obedience in joining our church. We would uh, encourage you to sign up for it. If you grab a bulletin, there's a QR code, you can sign up there, or you can just talk to me or Matthew and we'll get you signed up. Um, today's call to worship is coming from 1 Peter chapter 2. This is what the Word of God says. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Pray with me. Father, in a, in a world that continues to shift and to question its identity, Lord, uh, we Christians, we, we, we don't drift with these waves of culture. We, we stand strong with the words that you, God, say about us your church, a chosen race, a, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, people for your possession. And it's all to proclaim your excellencies, Lord. So, Father, we thank you for the reminder and for the truth that, that no one who comes to Jesus in faith will ever be cast out. We don't have to worry about you rejecting us, God, because you, we are your people. And, Father, we praise you. We, we lift our voices and we shout today of your greatness and of your beauty and of your majesty, Lord. Today as a church, we join together and we sing and we pray in the name of Christ. And it's in his name. Amen. Amen. Why don't you stand us as we start our worship this morning.
two boys, we are your missionaries serving in Vienna, Austria. Because of your generous giving, we are able to share the light of Christ to the nearly two million people who don't know the good news. So thank you for giving to the cooperative program and to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering so that our family can live here, gather locals to study God's word and plant new churches. Okay, ja, wir fangen an. Let's pray together. Father, as we watch that video and it reminds us of our International Mission Board missionaries, some 3,600 plus that we support as Southern Baptists all across the world. Uh, we pray this morning for each of them. We pray that in this Christmas season, we pray for just a, a fruitful and meaningful Christmas season for these missionary families. As, uh, as, Christmas, as Christmas comes, it's a time for many of us in which we think of family and we, uh, we enjoy spending time with family. And for these 3,000 plus missionaries, uh, many of them in this time, Lord, you know, uh, just are missing their families, they're lonely, and I pray, Father, that you, by the power of the Spirit, that you would minister to their hearts, Lord, that you would just meet them where they are, that you would give them a meaningful and wonderful Christmas season with their families, with their fellow missionaries, with the fellow, fellow local believers there. Lord, I pray that uh, you would just shepherd them and minister to them in this Christmas season. Lord, as we think about the International Mission Board, as we think about the Lottie Moon Christmas offering that we as Southern Baptists take up every Christmas season for just the furtherance of the gospel worldwide, Father, I pray for our church family. I pray for us that you would continue to mold us into a great commission-minded people. I pray, Lord, that, that we would view everything that you've given us through the eyes of the Great Commission through the eyes of your glory and the advancement of the gospel. Father, help us to, to view everything we have as a stewardship that has been given to us for your glory and for the, for the advancement of the gospel. I pray that we as a people, Lord, would continue to be generous toward great commission things like the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Father, I thank you for a rich legacy here at Olivet Baptist Church of just being a generous people toward the Great Commission. Lord, I thank you for that. I thank you knowing that that is not something that came from us alone, from our own power, from our own mindset. But Lord, that's something that you have given to us. You've given us a heart and a mind that has, has caught a Great Commission mentality. And I pray, Lord, that you would just further that within us, that you would cultivate just a great commission mentality. And Lord, that we would continue to be generous toward things that further the gospel. Father, we pray for the, for the IMB. We pray for the leadership of the IMB, for Paul Chitwood and all those who serve under him. We pray, Lord, for their godliness, for their holiness. We pray for their authenticity. We pray that you would give them wisdom and direction as they guide 
these 3,600 missionaries all across the world. Uh, Lord, just to, to build biblical strategies to reach unreached people groups all across the world. We pray for our missionaries. We pray for healthy missionaries that are healthy both physically, spiritually, emotionally, and mentally. We pray for healthy marriages. We pray for healthy uh, personal walks with you. And Lord, we just pray that uh, you would continue to do mighty things through our missionaries across the world and that we would just be faithful as a church family uh, to do what we can, to do our part, to pray, to give. And Lord, we pray also that you would raise some of us up to go for the glory of your name and for the advancement of the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, I invite you to stand with me. And also, I invite you to grab a copy of God's Word. As this morning in our sermon text, uh, I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But in our sermon text, in Matthew, we're going to be speaking and thinking about the resurrection of the dead. And so I want you to turn with me right now to 1 Corinthians 15. And uh, if you need a Bible, there's a black ESV pew Bible on the pew in front of you. Uh, I should have looked up what page number that is, but you can find that. And uh, I'm reading from the ESV, so if you do not have an ESV, then I'm going to ask all of us, I'm going to ask all of us, I'm going to read verses 12 through 22 and verses 50 through 58. I want you to read with me when it comes to verses 51 and 52, all right? So we're going to read God's Word together. I'm going to take most of it, but when it comes to 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 and 52, I want to invite all of us to read those two verses together. And so thus, uh, if, you don't, if you do not have an ESV, uh, if you try to read from the NIV or something like that, you're going to mess us up. So uh, grab one of those uh, pew Bibles or grab your phone. And let's consider together what is coming for us as followers of Jesus. The hope of heaven, the hope of a glorified heavenly body, no illness, no issues. This is what's coming for us. Listen as I read 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 12. Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it's true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also of us, who have, those who have fallen asleep in Christ, have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Read with me, starting in verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. For this, for this perishable body must put on the imperishable and this mortal body must put on immortality. And when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. 
But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, you be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Let's sing together of this truth. Let no one caught in sin remain inside the light of inward shame, but fix our eyes upon the cross and run to him who showed great love and bled for us. Freely you have bled for us. Let's declare a church. That Christ is risen from the dead, trampling over death by death. Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from the grave. Christ is risen from the dead, we are one with Him again. Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from the grave. Death, where is your sting? 
Stand in the light. Our God is not dead. He's alive. He's alive. If we believe it, let's praise Him this morning, church. Philippians 3 7 to 11. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness of God that depends on faith, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. My worth is not in what I own, not in the strength of flesh and bone, but in the costly wounds of love at the cross. My worth is not in skill or name, in win or lose, in pride or shame, but in the blood of Christ the flow. in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in Him, no other. My soul is satisfied in Him alone. As summer flowers we fade and die, fame, youth, and beauty Life eternal calls to us at the cross. Sing, I will not boast. I will not boast in wealth or might or human's wisdom fleeting life. But I will boast in knowing Christ at the cross. Let's rejoice together, church. in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in Him, no other. My soul is satisfied in Him alone again.
standing, if you will, and let's open God's Word together to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew 22, as we continue our study in the Gospel of Matthew, and don't worry, you do have a christmas theme sermon coming, not this morning, but next Sunday, all right? This morning we're in Matthew 22, we're going to be looking at verses 23 through 33, And I invite you to follow along with me as I read. Hear the word of the Lord. The same day, Sadducees came to Jesus, who say that there is no resurrection. And they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses said if a man dies having no children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first married and died, and having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. So too the second and the third down to the seventh. After them all, the woman died. So in the resurrection, therefore, of the seven, whose wife will she be? For they all had her. But Jesus answered them, You are wrong, because you know neither the Scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob? He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the crowd heard it, they were astonished at his teaching. Let's pray together. Father, as the psalmist of Psalm 119 says over and over again throughout that long chapter, Lord, we, we make his prayer our prayer of this morning. Give us understanding, Lord. As we come to your word this morning, we are people who are so often blind and distracted spiritually. And so we ask you this morning in the name of Christ and for the glory of Christ, for the exaltation of of Christ, for the enjoyment of Christ this morning among your people, we pray that you would give us understanding into your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Is there life after death? Well, according to recent polls, most Americans would actually seem to think so. Last year, the Pew Research Center found that 73% of all Americans, so out of all Americans they surveyed, they got a wide range of people, 73% of all Americans believe in heaven, while a few less, just 61%, believe in hell. Another study performed by San Diego State University found that 80% of Americans, 80%, believe in the afterlife, which is quite interesting especially when you consider the millennials and the Gen Zers and when you look at stats that we know about them and as Americans just in general, that right now we are reading our Bibles less, we are praying less, we're going to church less, we are overall just less religious. And yet we still, as a nation, we still continue to hold on very tightly to the, to the belief in the afterlife. Is there life after death? It is a question that is just as relevant today as it was some 2,000 years ago when it was put before Jesus. Last week, we watched as the Pharisees and the Herodians teamed up together, enemies became friends, and they teamed up together to try to trap Jesus in his words. You will remember that they, they buttered him up with flattery and presented him with a trick question. And Jesus saw through their hypocrisy immediately, dismantled their trap, and caused everyone to marvel in the process. So we have one failed attempt to catch Jesus in his words, one failed attempt under their belts, the enemies of Jesus. 
The first trap did not work. And so we notice in our text today that it's not the Pharisees and the Herodians, but another set of enemies for Jesus, the Sadducees. Uh, the first trap didn't work, and so they have a second trap for Jesus. The trap that the Pharisees and Herodians tried on Jesus was a political trap. Should we pay our taxes or not? Tell us. The trap this morning from the Sadducees is going to be a theological trap. Now, the Sadducees, it's important to know when we step into this, because the Sadducees aren't mentioned a whole lot in our New Testament, especially when you compare how much the Pharisees are mentioned. The Sadducees, they were the upper crust of Israel. They were the religious aristocrats. Most of them were wealthy, and most of them were priests. The Sadducees, when you consider and kind of compare and contrast them with the Pharisees, the Sadducees were much smaller in number than the Pharisees, and their theology differed quite a bit. For example, the Sadducees, they did not believe in the afterlife. They did not believe in angels or demons. They did not believe in the final judgment. And when it came to where they got their theology and their doctrine, where, whereas the, the Pharisees, they, they accepted the entire Old Testament as the authoritative word of God, the Sadducees only saw the first five books of the Old Testament as authoritative, the Torah or the Pentateuch. And so if a doctrine couldn't be defended from the first five books of the Old Testament. They rejected it outright. And in our passage today, uh, really just so if, if, if you're trying to follow where we're headed, uh, we have the Sadducees hypothetical question in verses 23 through 28, and we have the Sadducees spiritual problem in verses 29 through 33. And we see their hypothetical question Starting in verse 23, put your eyes there in verse 23 again. Because Matthew, he, he's cluing us in right from the get-go in verse 23 about these Sadducees. He says, the same day, in other words, the same day that the Pharisees and the Herodians tried to trap Jesus with this political trap, the same day the Sadducees came to him who say that there is no resurrection. So right there... Starting in verse 23, what Matthew, the gospel writer, is doing, he's cluing us into the fact of what this whole encounter is about. It is about the resurrection of the dead. So they come up to Jesus in verse 24, and they ask him a question. They say, teacher, Moses said, if a man dies having no children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers among us. And I don't know if you're like me, you like musicals, the sound of music, and then the other one that your mind starts going to now is what? Seven brides for seven brothers. The Sadducees, they, they, they didn't know what they were doing, but they were, they had the, they, they were already quoting the, uh, the musical there. Verse 23, now there were seven brothers among us. The first married and died, and having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. So to the second and the third down to the seventh. So, so you kind of catch the story. They're, they're painting this hypothetical story and they're saying, all right. So there were seven brothers in the Smith family. You had Shadrach. Shadrach married Susie. That sounds not Jewish at all. But Shadrach married Susie. But then Shadrach died. So then Meshach married Susie. But then Meshach died. And then Abednego married Susie, and sadly, and, and on and on. You, I mean, and, and they do this to the seventh power. It gets pretty ridiculous pretty quick. Verse 26, so to the second and the third, down to the seventh. After all of them, the woman died. So in the resurrection, which again, did they believe in the resurrection? No. In the resurrection, therefore, of the seven brothers, whose wife will she be? For they all had her. Now, this hypothetical scenario that the Sadducees are presenting to Jesus, it finds its roots deep back into the Old Testament in Deuteronomy chapter 25. Moses there in Deuteronomy 25, he issued laws concerning provision for widows. And what he's mentioning here, what they're, what they're kind of referencing is what you may have heard of as leveret marriage, which actually has nothing to do with Levi. Okay, from your Old Testament. So if you had been connecting leveret marriage with Levi, eh, 
What, what leveret marriage means is brother-in-law marriage. Brother-in-law marriage. Deuteronomy 25 says this, listen. It says, if brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the dead man shall not be married outside the family to a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her as his wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And the first son whom she bears shall succeed to the name of his dead brother, that his name may not be blotted out of Israel. So the purpose of this law, this leveret marriage law back in Deuteronomy 25, the purpose of this law was to keep a family from dying out and losing all of their property. But, that, but notice how the Sadducees are using this leveret marriage uh, issue. They're using it basically to make the afterlife look ridiculous. They ask this ridiculous question to try to create tension between the law of Moses and the belief in the resurrection of the dead. So if, as you say, there is an afterlife, then how could one woman be married to seven men? I mean, what would that look like in heaven? Tell us. What do you think, Jesus? So there's the trap. There's the theological trap that they're presenting to Jesus. Notice how Jesus responds in verses 29 through 33 where Jesus highlights the Sadducees' spiritual problem. And when we look at verses 29 through 33, we see that once again, like he did with the Pharisees and the Herodians, Jesus wasted no time at all in just dismantling their trap. Notice what he said to them in verse 29. Jesus, you know, was really gentle and meek here. He says, you are wrong. (laughs) You are wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. How is that for being direct? He says, man, you guys are just wrong. You're not just wrong, you're totally wrong. And the reason you're totally wrong is because you don't know the word of God or the resurrecting power of God. The first problem these men had was they didn't know the Word of God. Sure, they thought they knew the Word of God, but they didn't. They had a cursory understanding, not a deep understanding of God's Word. And I would just ask you, brother or sister, do you know the Word of God? Do you know the Word of God, or do you, like the Sadducees maybe, do you just think you know the Word of God? Do you know what the Word of God has to say on a variety of topics? Do you know what the Bible has to say about marriage? Do you know what the Bible has to say about angels, Satan, the demonic realm? Oh, no, there we go. Speaking of Satan, uh, the demons are getting my microphone here. Do you know what the Bible says about the atonement of Christ? about suicide, about the transgender movement, about the purpose of the local church, and on and on we go. Do you know the Scriptures? Are you acquainted with the Scriptures? Because every believer, every believer should strive to have a sound understanding of God's Word. And giving up or staying stagnant is not an option. God intends for you to grow. And he doesn't care if you've been walking with him for two months or two years or 62 years. He intends for you to grow. You always have at least one more step to make in your progressive sanctification and in your Christ-likeness. He intends for you to grow, to grow in Christ-likeness, to grow in taming the tongue, to grow in controlling your thoughts, to grow in your knowledge of God's word because after all, How are you going to grow in all of these other areas of your spiritual life if you do not first grow in this one area? So what are you doing right now? Right now. Again, no matter where you are and no matter how long you have been walking with Jesus, what are you doing right now to better acquaint yourself with God's Word? Think over your last week. Think over your last month. What have you been doing over the last month, over the last week? You say, ooh, that week hurts. Okay, over the last two months, three months, what have you been doing over all of 2022 to better acquaint yourself with the Word of God, to, to gain a firmer grasp 
with the word. And if you're not doing anything right now, honestly, if you're honest with yourself and you're like, I haven't really been intentional in trying to grow and better acquaint myself in God's word, as you step into 2023, what a wonderful time to consider this question. What are you going to do? What could you start doing in 2023 to better acquaint yourself with God's word so that you don't be, become like a Sadducee? Where you think, I, I think I know God's word, but turns out, Jesus might say the same thing to you. Hey, you're, you don't know the word. You think you know it, but you don't know it. And my, my two encouragements to you stepping into 2023, very simple, would just be to read the word of God individually, personally, and to read the word of God with others. And, and when it comes to reading the, God, reading the word of God personally, Uh, We as Americans, I think you know as well as I do, we as Americans, we have no excuse in this department. We've got got quality English translations of the Bible. We've got good quality study Bibles all over the place. We've got just all kinds of tools. And if you need help in that department, talk talk to one of your elders. Talk to us. Talk to some brothers and sisters here, and we will get you a good study Bible. We'll point you in that direction. Get, read the Word of God with others. Get in a discipling relationship. Very practically, if you're not in a discipleship group, we have these discipleship groups that meet all throughout the week, men meeting with men, women meeting with women, and what are they doing together? I mean, it's not rocket science. Usually we're reading through a good book of the Bible, good, oh, every book of the Bible's good. We're reading through a good Christian book together that's helping us better acquaint ourselves with God's word, or we're reading through a book of the Bible. We're praying together. We're seeking to do each other spiritual good. If you can't hop into a discipleship group, that, that's not the only thing out there for you to grow spiritually and be in a discipling relationship. Find some other Create some other discipling relationship. Grab somebody else you know here who would be interested in reading the Word of God together, praying together, and just helping each other grow spiritually. And that is how you can start to better understand and better acquaint yourself with God's Word. We have got to know God's Word. And the Sadducees, they didn't know God's Word. But did you see what else Jesus said they didn't know? He said, He said, you are wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor what? Nor the power of God. You don't know the Bible and you don't know the power of God. Jesus steps up to these guys and he says, you guys obviously don't know the power of God. Do you think you who would affirm what Genesis says about God, that he created the world ex nihilo, out of nothing, He spoke and it came into being. You think that God really doesn't have the power? If he can do all of this back in Genesis 1 and 2, you guys think that he doesn't have the power to resurrect from the dead and renew creation? You don't think that the sovereign God of all the universe, you don't think he can handle your pathetic little hypothetical situation, is that how puny you think he is? Because if so, you're showing you don't know him. So they knew neither the power of God nor the word of God. And when it comes to the word of God in particular, they did not know what the word of God had to say about marriage and the afterlife. I'm curious, do you know what the Bible says about marriage and the afterlife. Jesus said, you are wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. Look at what he says in verse 30. This is where they were wrong. For in the resurrection, in other words, when it's all said and done, and Christ returns, and we all take on our resurrected bodies, and we live forever somewhere. And here he's talking about heaven. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. Key word, they are like angels in heaven. That is good to clarify as it's a wonderful life is just playing on repeat on your TVs. And and many of you, maybe you've already watched it or you have it lined up. You've got that tradition. I'm going to watch it. It's a wonderful life. And every time I hear a bell ring, you know, an angel gets its wings. 
And we say these things, and uh, I walked into a house uh, recently. Uh, it was wonderful because it kind of took me back to my childhood because in this person's living room, I'm not going to point them out in this room or, or otherwise, but uh, in this person's living room, there was a massive, I don't even know what you call it, like a massive glassed in, like where you would put like trophies and knickknacks and like precious things and, and no pun intended, there was a bunch of precious moments. Like the thing was full. Is it called precious moments? The little chubby angels, you know, that like look like Cupid on clouds and, and uh, they had a whole, I'm talking massive, I mean just full of precious moments and I walked over to that and we had a fun conversation about it and I remember as a boy, every Mother's Day, every Christmas, anytime it was time to get my mom a gift, guess what I would have my grandmother take me to Mardell or whatever and get, a precious moments for my mom. And now I laugh because I'm like, she probably hated those things, but but we, we have the precious moments and we have those things. And I think, I think there are several Christians out there who, who may, I, I don't know that they would say it out loud, or, but I, I wouldn't be surprised that, that, that this, this mindset is out there that we're going to kind of become angelic. We're going to become angels. And, and, and on a more serious note, maybe you, like me, have been at a funeral the death of a child especially, and you hear people share, they're trying to encourage, they're trying to be positive, they're trying to be uplifting, and, and maybe they'll make a side comment like, you know, heaven got another angel. And, and, and look, we're not going on a tirade against that, but, but let's clarify what Jesus said. Jesus said in verse 30, for in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. We will not become angels. We will become like angels in the fact that we will no longer be married. So in their poor attempt to set up an argument that they could just easily dismantle, the Sadducees wrongly assumed that marriage would exist in heaven. And, and like I said earlier, earlier, I wonder, I wonder, have you ever thought much about that question? Especially if you're married. Have you ever thought much about the topic of marriage and the afterlife, marriage and heaven? Because according to Jesus, marriage will not exist in heaven. It is a temporary institution that is meant for this life only. And I would also be curious to know at this point, because maybe for some of you, maybe you're like, I, I actually haven't ever like thought of that. There were things that... I just kind of assumed about heaven. So I don't know how this truth initially strikes you, but I'm sure for some of you, when you start thinking about this, it's actually like when you consider how much you love your spouse, it's a little troubling. You love your spouse with all that you are, and the thought of, the thought of enjoying heaven together for all of eternity is something that kind of warms your heart. And then I think about those of you in our faith family who, who your spouse has already died and is already with the Lord. And I can think of multiple in our faith family right now. This is you. Your spouse has already died. They've already gone on to be with the Lord. And you miss them like crazy. And when you think about that day, which it is coming, when you think about that day when Christ comes back and we all are redeemed and we all receive our glorified bodies, and you think about that one instant when you will connect eyes with your spouse again, it, it, it just overwhelms your heart with joy and excitement and exhilaration. And thus it should. That is going to be a glorious day when you will see your spouse again. And not just when you see your spouse. Maybe for those of you who aren't married, I mean, think about those loved ones, your, your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister who died in Christ ahead of you. And you think about that day when you're going to step into eternity and you're going to see all of these people. And you're not just going to see them in some kind of spiritual, ethereal, just you're going to see them physically with your own heavenly, glorified no glasses or context kind of eyes, you're going to see them, and then, almost instantaneously, you're going to, with your physical, heavenly, 
out of this world kind of new physical body, you're going to embrace them. It's going to be a glorious day. And yes, we will know each other. I I don't know that I can point to like a chapter and verse here, so let me just throw that out there. But I, I thoroughly think we're going to know each other in heaven. Whoever goes first, Courtney and I always debate this and I always say, I'm going first. You know, we kind of joke about it. But if I go first and then Courtney comes later, when it's all said and done, whoever goes first, when we see each other in heaven, we're going to know each other. I'm thoroughly convinced we're not just going to know each other, but we're, we're going to remember the life that we shared together. We're going to remember all the joys and the wonderful memories and but we won't be married anymore. And if you've never stopped to reflect on that, you're like, well, what, what is that going to be like? I mean, like, if my parents just celebrated this year 50 years of, of, of being married. Uh, somebody in our congregation, again, I'm not going to point them out, just celebrated 60 years. They're in this room, so you can kind of look around and see who you might think it is. Just celebrated 60 years, 60 years, 60 plus years when you consider dating. And they have spent, I mean, 60 years together making memories and enjoying fellowship together. And and they will know each other. They will remember the life they shared together, but they will not be married anymore. We will not be married anymore. And yet, listen to me, and yet, in that moment, in heaven, Though we will not be married, though Courtney and I will not be married, our relationship will be astronomically better than it ever was on this earth. Think about that for a second. And this is true, this is true even if you have just an absolutely rock solid marriage. As wonderful as and as loving and as intimate and as, and as communal as marriage on this side of heaven is, as wonderful as our relationship has been and will be, it, it's not perfect. But there, there, my kids ask me where heaven is and it's like trying to explain. It seems like it's up and some other dimension. But there, then... My relationship with Courtney will be what? It'll be perfect. My relationship with her will be way better than it ever was here on this earth. And this will be true, listen to me, this will be true not just of my relationship with Courtney and and your relationship with your spouse in heaven. This is going to be the kind of depth of fellowship and union and love and intimacy and communion that all of us will have with one another. You think about the strongest, godliest marriage in our church family. And then you consider the fact in heaven, that relationship between the two of them and the relationship between all 175 or 180 or whatever of us, it is going to be astronomically deeper and richer and and just than any strong, godly marriage this side of heaven. And, And here's the thing. Here's another thing that I think we sometimes miss in this discussion, that that on this side of heaven... We just, it's, it's hard for us to fathom these things. I understand it. I've been thinking on this, obviously, a lot this week. Just celebrated 15 years of marriage myself. I love my wife to death. And yet, here's another thing I think we sometimes miss in this discussion. When we get to heaven and we stand in the glorious presence of God, and we're there in the majestic grandeur of heaven, and we see Jesus Christ face to face, and we enjoy a depth of fellowship and communion and intimacy and joy with our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ like we are going to experience, marriage is going to be the last thing on our minds. The last thing on our minds. In fact, again, I'm just pontificating. These are just pastoral pontifications here. I wonder if we'll even think about it. 
Like literally. I mean, we may think about it in the sense that I look at Courtney and I'm like, oh, we were married for, you know, hopefully a long time. We shared a life together. By God's grace, we raised, you know, godly children, whatever. Like we, we'll think about marriage in those instances, but there will, never, there will never be even a millisecond where we kind of, you know, lean on something and say, ah, oh, man, like, like where we will have regret like, man, I wish we could just experience what we did. Like, we, you know, we had such a good life together. And we should, we, there will not even be a, that won't even be a thought in our minds because we will, so, we will be just enraptured in the glory and grandeur of heaven and God and the fellowship that we have with one another. Because let me just take it a little bit further. When we think about the level of communion and fellowship and intimacy that we're going to have together with one another as brothers and sisters in Christ, marriage, earthly marriage, will, will, will feel like and look like just a cheap earthly substitute for what we're going to experience with one another in heaven. You take the most godly, rock-solid marriage here that you say, man, those guys are, those people are, so, that, that couple is so, so close. And when we get to heaven and we experience the type of interpersonal relationships and fellowship there, we will look back at the godliest marriage on earth and we will say, that's just a cheap substitute. It will be so, so rich. So in this, I'm not just speaking to those of you who are married. I'm speaking to the joy of all of us, single, divorced, married. When we get to heaven, and what's also interesting is you look out in our culture, and especially since COVID, it's glaring. Yeah, we spend all this time on our screens, and especially the millennials and the Gen Zers and whatever the other one is underneath them. And, and we feel, we say we're so and seem so connected on social networking and social media. And yet still, we betray ourselves. We show that we were hardwired by our maker to have personal intimacy, personal fellowship and communion together with one another. That is what the people in our culture who do not know Christ and do not have brothers and sisters in Christ, whether they know it or not, they're they're screaming for that. And I'm I'm gonna look for that level of fellowship and union and satisfaction and meaning. I mean, it's Ecclesiastes wrapped up with a bow. And I'm looking for this level of intimacy and fellowship and connection with, with, with just, can you give it to me in any fashion? And I think as C.S. Lewis would say, if you find a desire like that, that's in your heart, that like nothing on this earth horizontally can, can satisfy What is the most logical conclusion? Your maker put that desire there. And when you go and try to find that horizontally, it's going to leave you dissatisfied. Because you were made to enjoy that and experience that. And you will if you were a follower of Jesus and you will spend eternity in heaven. And just, just try this on for size. Just to help us grasp even just a slice of this, I want you to think with me. I want you to use your imagination for a second. And I want you right now, I'm being serious, I want you to try to imagine, try to think of the greatest possible experience that you'll have in heaven. So if you need to stare at the bricks, look down. I want you to try to think about the greatest possible experience you will have in heaven. Maybe it's a a person that you will see again. Maybe it's just like a Garden of Eden-esque. You love the outdoors and you're like, how beautiful and majestic it is going to be. Now what I want you to do, I want you to take the joy and the exhilaration 
that you think you're going to experience in that moment, and I want you to multiply it by a trillion, and then I want you to realize that you are not even close to what's coming for you if you're a Christian. Because although marriage is a wonderful and joyous gift from God, the joys and pleasures that we will experience in heaven will so far outweigh marriage, we will not miss marriage in the least bit. Because as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, what no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor the heart of man imagined. Basically, that's Paul's way of saying, try it. Try to imagine the most glorious and awesome environment. And you're not even close. What no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor the heart of man imagined, this is what God has prepared for those who love him. So the question, all of that, when it comes to marriage and the afterlife, the question isn't a matter of what we're going to lose. The question is a matter of what we're going to gain. So the Sadducees, they were wrong about marriage. But notice in verse 31, they were also wrong about the resurrection of the dead. Jesus said in verse 31, put your eyes there, he said, And as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Now, if you've got a, if you've got a, a Bible that gives you cross-references, and you'll see that, that that quote is coming from where? It's coming from Exodus chapter 3. Now, Jesus could have quoted all over the Old Testament to affirm the resurrection of the dead, but he chose to pull his evidence from the Torah, from the first five books of the Old Testament. Why? Because, as you remember, the Sadducees only saw the first five books of the Old Testament as authoritative. And so essentially what, this is, what Jesus is doing here is he is beating them at their own game. And this was Jesus' point. He was saying, when God introduced himself to Moses back in Exodus chapter 3, the burning bush, when God introduced himself to Moses, God didn't say, I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He said, I am. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In other words, Moses, as I'm talking to you right now, these men of faith, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they're alive and well. Right now as I speak to you, he is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So according to Jesus Christ, you are going to live forever. The question is never, and has never been, and will never be, the question is never if, but where. Where will you spend eternity? If you were to die today, would you spend eternity in heaven? It's a legitimate question. Is it a, it's a question that is relevant as, uh, today as it was 2,000 years ago. Where will you spend eternity? And for those of you who are here this morning who, like, you honestly don't know the answer to that question, Jesus wants you to know. Jesus wants you to know. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live again. So if you're here this morning and your desire is to live forever with Jesus Christ in a perfect heaven, with perfect fellowship, with brothers and sisters in Christ then what he calls you to do is to turn from your sins, to trust in Jesus with all of your heart for salvation, and to just begin a life now of just faithfully following him for the rest of your life. Now, to those of you, most of you in this room, you, you know the answer to this question. You know that you're going to spend eternity with Jesus. And if that is you, which is, I think, again, I think most of us, then Jesus' words to you this morning, let them encourage you. Let them, uh, as we come into Christmas, let them fill you with hope because heaven is coming. What no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no heart has imagined, it's coming. 
And I know you're like me in that there are days and there are instances in which sometimes it doesn't feel like it's coming. It feels like evil is winning out. It feels like there is not a lot of hope left in the tank. But Jesus is reminding you and me this morning, he is coming, that heaven is coming. And the most glorious and awesome, mind-blowing, imagine-exceeding context and fellowship and union and joy and pleasure and exhilaration, it is coming. So all of that, be encouraged, be hopeful, and be patient as we wait for his coming and for, for the glorious eternity and the glorious fellowship that we're going to enjoy with Jesus Christ and with one another. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you for the hope of heaven. We thank you for the encouragement we have this morning as we reflect on the fact that those of us who are in Jesus Christ, those of us who have placed our faith in him and are just seeking to live faithfully for him in the here and now, that we will live for forever with him and with one another in perfect harmony, in perfect fellowship, and in a perfect context. And so I pray this morning, I pray for my faith family. And Lord, you know, you know the situation of every heart in this room. You know what they're staring down as they come to the end of this year. You know what diagnosis they've just received. You know what good news or bad news have just come to them. And so, Lord, I pray that you, in your wisdom, in your goodness, in your gentleness and mercy, in your compassion, in your love, that you would take your word this morning and you would minister to every heart in here. You would take your word and you would fill your people with hope. You would remind them of what it's so easy for us to forget. Remind, remind us that heaven is coming. Remind us that, that an eternal life with you in your presence, in the glorious grandeur of heaven, it's coming. And it will be here before we know it. And Lord, I pray that you would take these truths, that you would just put them deep in our hearts and our minds, that you would use them to encourage us, to give us hope as we go into our week and as we go into the end of this year. And we ask it all in the precious name of Jesus Christ, who is our Savior, He is our Redeemer, and He is coming again. We say, come Lord Jesus. Amen. Let's stand together as we close out our time in song, singing about the resurrection life that is coming for each of us. Let's sing it. There's a peace I've come to know Though my heart and flesh may fail, there's an anchor for my soul, and I can say it is well. Jesus is overcome, and the grave is over.
there's a day that's drawing near when this darkness breaks to light in the shadow the grave. It's my privilege to pray a doxology uh, from Jude over you as a benediction. Jude verses 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. 